Father, we love you tonight. We've gathered together to hear your word, to prepare our hearts for a judgment seat that we're actually excited to stand before. Most people are fearful, Lord, of being brought before a judge. And there is a little bit of concern in our lives because we know that we haven't lived perfectly. And you're calling and challenging us to obviously do better. But the whole point of this seat is a time for rewards, ribbons, crowns. And so, Father, we just pray that even through the challenge of what we will hear in the message and see in the movie, that we will get the point that we are your children and victory is secure because Christ purchased it for us on the cross. Thank you for that. And yet still challenge us change us more into his glorious image by means of our time spent in your holy word tonight. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I became aware of a rather unusual study that was performed by a psychologist. It was given to different groups of students. Uh, Ten classmates would be brought into a room with peers of their own age, and they were shown two lines on a chart One line was visibly longer than the other. And the students were asked to vote on which line was the shortest. Now, it seemed obvious, except for the fact that what one student did not know is that the other nine children were told previously, vote for the shorter line. And so the voting took place. The average person would look around at the two lines supposedly voting for the longer one, but then saw all the students with their hands up voting for the shorter line, would shake his head, raise his hand with the rest of the students, and vote for the wrong line. This happened again and again and again. It was performed under different circumstances, differing age groups, from the first all the way to the 12th grade, and the results were 75% of single students voted for the wrong line on purpose. The psychologist's conclusion, most children would rather be president than be right. (laughs) And what's true of students in a classroom could also be true of saints in a church. Sometimes we would rather go along with the crowd and feel accepted and warm than please Christ and be correct. You know, God is so gracious, we're not punished for every infraction that we perform instantaneously. And so consequently, we tend to continue with our improper behavior, not thinking about the long-range consequences down the line. But the Bible says that a day is coming when each one of our lives will be carefully examined by the Lord of love. Now, this examination, will be very compassionate, and yet on the same side, also comprehensive. It will be like having your life on video every moment that occurred from the instant you came to Christ. Every single stone will not be left unturned. Now, Paul speaks of this remarkable event in the third chapter of his first letter to the church at Corinth. And that's where you've turned tonight. And he also refers to it in his second chapter. And I'd like to read that to you from 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. He writes, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one of us may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he or she has done, whether good or bad. Now, the judgment seat is the translation of the Greek word bematos, from which we get our word bema that we're using tonight. This is the great tribunal seat upon which Christ will sit one day, and he will judge every single saint whom he has purchased with his life's blood. This is not the great white throne judgment seat. That's reserved for the unbelievers, the unregenerate, It will occur 1,000 years later at the end of the millennial kingdom. The Bema seat is reserved for believers only. When will it occur? Well, 
if I read my Bible right, it could take place in the next 10 minutes. According to the flow of Scripture, the next event to occur on God's eschatological timetable is the rapture. The church will suddenly and swiftly be whisked into glory. And then the tribulation starts on planet Earth as the Antichrist sets up his evil and pernicious reign. Now, while the tribulation is occurring on Earth, we are busy in heaven. It seems to me it may take those seven years, as it were, for all the saints of all the ages to stand before Christ at the Bema seat. So as we have on your outline tonight, the title, Let the Bema Begin. And we're going to do that by seeing the picture that Paul presents for us on the Bema seat of Christ in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, verses 10 to 15. Now, you'll note on your outline, he begins by laying the support for your life. The support for your life, verses 10 to 11. According to the grace of God, which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid the foundation and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. No man could lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So he's the support for your life. There is no other foundation, no other support upon which a saint's life is built. This is critical. This is crucial. This is non-negotiable. The point is you will never reach the Bema seat unless you believe in Jesus Christ, unless you have a personal relationship with the one who died for your sins and rose again from the grave to prove to you that he's God. That's the relationship that changes everything for time and eternity. You cannot get to heaven. You will not reach the Bema seat by means of religious activities, righteous achievements, or a resplendent attitude. Now, the world loves that stuff. The world applauds that stuff. And people tend to think, that's my ticket to heaven. But the Bible says all of that is bankrupt when it comes to getting to glory. Once you become a Christian, it's all significant. But to become a Christian, you need to come just on the basis of faith alone. The Bible says in Titus 3, verses 5 to 6, it's not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us. And then that bold, brash statement in Romans 4, 5, to the one who does not work, does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. You can't work for it, you can't earn it, you can't achieve it. You just accept the gift that God has given you, and once that occurs, you have a foundation laid in your life. And the support from this point on is your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul says, I became a wise master builder. We wrote, read that just a moment ago. That's the only time that little phrase in the Greek is found in the New Testament. It's the Greek word architecton. Guess what word we get from architecton? Architect, exactly. Tecton means to beget or to give birth. It was used of a craftsman, a creator, or a woodsman. Archi is like archangel or archbishop. It means the top or foremost. So it's the foremost builder, the top builder. Now the point is simply this. We're talking about the creator and the initiator of your salvation. We know that's Jesus Christ. Jesus told Peter shortly before his execution in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church. This is not Pastor Rick's church. It's not the people's church. It's not the congregation's church. It's the church of Jesus Christ. He's the one who purchased it with his life's blood. But then he says, God gave me the architectural drawings or the blueprint so I could help to lay the foundation in the city of Corinth. My job is to be a wise master builder. 
Now, Pastor Ray Steadman, who went to be with the Lord a few years ago, put it in these words. Most people think of a preacher as an individual with a dark suit who has an unclear mind and always speaks with a holy groan. But what we ought to think of a preacher as a man who wears a hard hat and a carpenter's apron and carries a saw and a hammer, he is building something. And when I look at that, I agree that's my passion and that's my purpose in life. It's very simple. To take the teachings of this book and to build into every single one of you a living, vital, and vivacious relationship with Jesus Christ. And it all starts when you accept him as your savior, recognizing he died for you, rose again, you appropriate that gift to your heart, and then life truly begins. And I believe this is important. That's why every single Sunday, and it may become redundant, and some of you at the end of the message may think, here he goes again. I know exactly how he's going to end. I always give what? An invitation to accept Christ. And the reason I continue to do that is because I want every single person who walks through those doors to stand with me at the Bema seat before Jesus someday. So I will continue to do that. The great playwright Arthur Miller was married to Marilyn Monroe in the 1950s. In his autobiography, he describes her descent into depression and despair. Miller said, there was no way that I or anyone else could save Marilyn from the demons that plagued her, loneliness, paranoia, and then eventually addiction to barbiturates. One evening, there was another visit from yet a doctor who talked Marilyn into taking a sedative. And as she lied there, Miller said, I was pensive, and I was beginning to wonder to myself, what if she were able to wake up? And I were able to say, Marilyn, do you know that Jesus loves you? And what if she were able to believe it? And then he concludes with the words, how I wish I still had my faith in God and how I wish Marilyn had hers. We don't know their destiny, but from all that we could tell, it did not seem that either one of them had a relationship with Christ. What a difference it would have made for time and eternity had they both trusted in the Savior. He's the only one who serves as the support for your life. Now, once you've accepted him, once you've embraced the gift that he's given you, you have a solid support. And you move to the second point that's on your outline tonight, and that is the structure of your life. You have the support for your life, and now let's take a look at the structure of your life. Paul says, I laid out the stakes, I dug up the earth, put in the sand, poured the foundation, smoothed out the cement, and then God moved me on. And then he brought to Corinth Apollos and other teachers, and they helped to create the structure for your spiritual life in the city of Corinth. Now, the idea of another is used here. As he talks about each man must be careful on how he builds on it. And another man comes and builds, and yet another after that. But the reference to another that's used here is not just qualified pastors and teachers. They're not the only people building into your life. It's far more inclusive than that. In fact, what I see in verse 12, now if what? any man, and then in verse 14, if any man, and then in verse 15, if any man. And so it's a larger context when it comes to the structure and the design of your spiritual life. Do you know that just by being here tonight, you're actually building into the life of another Christian? Being present in church not doing anything except just saying smiling or smiling and saying it's good to see you builds encouragement, builds strength, builds reinforcement. Each one of us, every point in the day, 
are called to build into the lives of each other. We have the privilege of helping to create the structure of our eternal lives. Now, it's a very comprehensive construction project. Once we got the okay from the city and secured the necessary permits, I discovered what it was like to create the structure that we have here at Orange Coast. For a long period of time, we went into the process of creating plumbing, electricity, heating, air conditioning, the wood framing, drywalling, the ceiling, lighting, carpeting, tile floors, cabinets, shelving, which culminated in three bathrooms, three offices, numerous classrooms, a nursery, a kitchen area, a storage room, a foyer, and a sanctuary for worship, all in the tune of $580,000. Long time and a lot of money. More time and more value is being invested into the temple that you're being built tonight than the one that you're sitting in this evening. Because your temple is not temporal. It's eternal. We are creating a sanctuary that lasts for all eternity. All eternity. Look at verse 10. The end of verse 10. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. Now, the operative word there is the word how. I have that underlined in my Bible. That's the emphasis in verse 10, verse 12, and verse 13. The problem with us, especially in America, and particularly in Southern California, we are impressed with quantity. When pastors get together, what's the first question they ask? How big is your church? Are you successful? Are you really walking with God? If you are, you're going to have thousands following you. Jesus Christ was never really emphasized or uh, interested in quantity. We know he was concerned about quality because at one point in John chapter 6, he had probably 15,000 people, counting men, women, and children, following him after the feeding on the hillside. And what did he do? He turned to them and said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. And he blinked and 15,000 were gone. Every single person left except the 12. And even one of them, he said, is a devil. So Jesus had a way of dispersing crowds, not necessarily attracting. Oh, yes, he wants more people to come to him. But that's a side note. The side note should always be quantity. The keynote should be quality. It's how you build on the life. Does he say let each man be careful that he constructs a large tract of homes? No. But that he is careful with the one single life that God has given him or her on which to construct. The word builds in the Greek is in the present tense. And we know in the Greek language that is always present. Every moment of every day, you are working on the structure of your life. God wants it to be a continual effort and emphasis. Young boy asked his aged grandfather, hey, granddad, why do you keep reading your Bible all day long? And granddad said, well, you might say I'm cramming for my final exam. <laughs> God says, don't be cramming at the last few moments of your life. Just consistently and slowly and regularly build into your spiritual life. Now, note the materials that you're using for building tonight. Verse 12. Now, if any man builds on the foundation, and here they are, with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw. That's the elements. They're obviously put into two categories. There's no adversative in the Greek because it's obvious from the type of material that there's a difference between the first three and the second three that are mentioned. Now, notice, this is very important. These do not refer to spiritual gifts, riches, talents, or intelligence. Those things are nice, but these are not the elements 
that build into your life. You say, Pastor, then what builds into my life? Good works. Good works are what you and I are using to create this incredible temple that will last for eternity. We know this because Paul writes in Ephesians 2 and verse 10, you were created in Christ Jesus for good works. In other words, he designed you to do something good. Every saint is saved to serve. Say that with me. Every saint is saved to serve. So find out some kind of ministry you can get involved in and spend your life caring for others because as you do, you're building into your eternal temple. We're also told in Colossians 1.10 to be fruitful in every good deed that you do. These are the attitudes, these are the activities that make up the makeup of our personal lives. Now, the first group is gold, silver, and precious stones. These are the stones that are used in constructing a beautiful temple or a king's palace, something that is made with quality in mind and designed to endure for a lifetime. The finest of materials go into a king's palace. The second grouping that we read, wood, hay, and straw, are not necessarily bad materials. They were just used in the construction of a common home. Wood was used for the doors and framing. Hay was used with dry grass mixed with mud to create the walls. And of course, the straw was placed on the roof to keep the wind and the rain out. You would never find wood, hay, or straw in a temple or a king's palace. And that's the point that I want to send home to you tonight. I'm going to make a statement, and I want you to repeat it after me. Say with me, I am important. Say that with me. I am important. Turn to the person next to you and say, you are valuable. God wants you to own that truth. You're the most important person on earth because Christ died for your sins and purchased you with his blood. And he wants you to own that how valuable you are, and how valuable every person in this room is because once you get that truth, you won't want to stay away on Sundays. You won't want to miss an opportunity to build into their life and into yours. You'll be excited. You'll be thrilled because you're using something of significance to pour into a person who has an estimable value. And because of the fact that you are not wood, hay, and stubble. Because of the fact that you are gold, silver, and precious stones, that's where the Holy Spirit is going to reside. If you scoot down in the passage, you'll see in verse 16, he asks with the question, don't you even know? You are a temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you. The holiest place on planet Earth is where you are at any point in time. You are far holier than the Taj Mahal or even this building when it's absent. You are important because God's spirit, the third person of the, tri the Trinity, the creator and master designer of the universe is residing in you. And he doesn't want to take up residence in a ghetto looking structure. So get it together. Take care of your life spiritually and make sure that he has a great-looking place in which to dwell. <laughs> Choose the materials for your building very carefully. A rich man was going away on a long journey, so he summoned a master builder, and he said, I'm going to be gone for about six months, and I'm going to give you the specifications for a house that I want constructed. Now, I'm going to be gone for a long time. I'm not going to be watching over your shoulder. I want you to spare no pains and make sure that you spare no expense as well in creating everything I've asked you to make. I want the highest quality 
Do not sacrifice quality. I will pay for everything. Do you understand me? He said, yes. Well, the man who was going to purchase the place took off, and of course the master builder thought, I'm not going to spend that much time, that much effort, that much energy on this guy's house. So he skimped and he cut corners left and right. And he created a structure which looked beautiful from the outside, but it was chintzy and cheap. It was not created in a quality way. Six months later, he returned. The man who was going to purchase it said, well, I am going to buy this structure, and I'm buying it for you and your family to live in. It's my gift to you. It's exactly what God did for you at Calvary. And he says to you tonight, why would you use wood, hay, and stubble when you're going to be living in this house for eternity? Eternity. Now that's what I want to send home to you tonight. That the home you're erecting right now is the one you're going to live in in Tomorrowland. When Jesus rose from the grave, he was given his resplendent, glorious body. But it looked a whole lot like his old body. It was a little bit better, but it was the same basic structure. That's the exact same body you're going to have. Don't think, you know, I want Tom Cruise nose, I want this girl's thighs. Don't think that way. It's not going to happen when you see Jesus. That's the body I've always wanted. You are going to be yourself just a little bit better version than you. And so what you've got now, I hope you like because you're going to have it forever. Now, the wonderful thing is the Shekinah glory will be covering you and me, and so we won't be focused on the physical aspects that draw our attention today. God's glory will be seen. But what you're creating right now in your personal life is what you're going to carry with you into Tomorrowland. That's what is important. Don't think you could live a spiritually lazy lifestyle. Don't think you could sin up a storm and it's not going to hamper you when you get to heaven. I'm here to tell you it will hamper you. It will affect you, and you will not be nearly as effective as you could have been had you responded to the grace and love and tenderness of God that he's given you tonight through the teaching of his word. My Christian character, or my lack of it, is something I will carry with me throughout all eternity. To put it another way, who you are today, in a real sense, is who you will be tomorrow. You say, but I don't like me. Good, change you. <laughs> don't make any more excuses. Don't blame your spouse. Don't blame your pastor. Don't blame your parents. Take responsibility for those character flaws and overcome them, because as we'll see in just a moment, there are special rewards given to those who focus on those flaws and change them. And so when you hear me up here every Sunday hammering on you to be sure to come to church, to be sure to forgive the one who's failed you, to get into study of God's word, to reach out and love, what I'm actually doing every Sunday is challenging you to construct a beautiful temple. A temple that you can be proud of, a temple that Jesus will be proud of, and so when that rapture comes, you'll be the first one in line to say, put me up there at the Mama seat. Check it out, Jesus. Look what I've done for you. And that's the attitude he wants all of us to have. Because we have focused on a building that's not made of wood, hay, and straw. One pastor writes, I know a businessman who devoted his whole life to making lots of money. His children always knew 
they had less priority than his job. He never said that, but our deepest devotions leak out of our bodies and people see how we spend our time, what makes us smile, and what claims our energy. This man built a successful corporate empire and all of his employees felt used. He and his wife bought a magnificent home overlooking the ocean in Southern California and then he had a stroke. No one came to visit him. Today he sits in a wheelchair breathing from an oxygen tank alone in a mansion cage, still obsessing over what he owns, remaining completely incapable of any form of gratitude. That is the ruined soul. That's the person who has built his life with wood, hay, and straw. Notice the pastor did not say he was out sexing up women. He was out doing drugs, living a loose lifestyle. That's not the point we're making tonight. He built with materials that the average person would applaud, but they were inferior materials. They were wood, hay, and straw. Don't use those materials to build into the temple that God wants you to have. And the reason why? is because the life you're constructing right now will be tested by God's fire one day. And that brings us to our third point. We've seen the support for your life. We've seen the structure of your life. And now we see the summation of your life. Your life is going to be summed up. And notice, first of all, in the summation, the surprising revelation on your outline. The surprising revelation it pops up in verse 13. Each man's work, each woman's work, will become evident, for the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with what? Fire. Do you know the Greek word for fire is spelled P-U-R, poor or pure? That's where we get our word purity or to purify, because the fire purifies the work. Hebrews 12, 29. Our God is a consuming fire. He's not like a consuming fire. He doesn't look like a consuming fire. He is a consuming fire. As I've said before and will say again, never connect Satan with hell. He has nothing to do with hell. He will never go to hell. He will go to a place called the lake of fire. But right now, he is the prince of the power of the air. Then who started hell? God started hell. Hell comes out of his very presence. He is a consuming fire. We're told that when Jesus met John on the island of Patmos in Revelation chapter 1, that when he saw him in verse 14, he said, his eyes were like a flame of fire, penetrating into the depths of John's soul. And we will see that picture of Christ, hopefully someday soon. Now, when his eyes penetrate, they will examine our performance from the point in time in which we accepted him as our personal savior. Prior to Christ, he's not interested in that. That was all done away with and washed away. But the moment I bowed my knee and said, Christ, come into my life, then he becomes concerned. He's looking at that point on. And the fire is going to examine that. You say, now you got me scared, Pastor. Now you're getting me to think, when I get to heaven, I think that God's going to be out to get me. I think he's going to be out to hurt me in some way. You may be afraid you're going to get to glory, and God's going to say, did anyone ever tell you how wonderful you are. And you say no, and then he will say, then where'd you ever get the idea? <laughs> Is that what God's going to say? Is God going to say to you, I like, I do really like your approach. Now let's see your departure. Get out of here. 
Gabriel, go get the club. He's been a bad boy. We're going to beat him. Some of you tonight live with that fear. Some of you are thinking that God's going to get me there and turn me over his knee. It broke my heart to hear years ago of a dear saint who was in our church who's now in glory. And when this person was dying, this saint said to another member of our church, I'm not looking forward to get to heaven because I've been a bad girl. I know that God's going to really get on my case. Now, I didn't hear that until after that saint died. And I wish I could have been there to reassure them. Many years ago, when I first came to this church, I was counseling with the woman who was slowly dying of cancer. And she was a godly woman. But she was overcome by all these fears of how God was going to judge her and put her down when she breathed her last breath. And I had to reassure her, that's not going to happen. That's why the Bible uses the word propitiation, which means God was angry at you and me because of our sin. But he took all that anger and he poured it out right here on the cross. He dumped out all the rage. And now it's spent. And now when he sees you, he sees Jesus Christ covering your life. He sees his blood and his love, and he has no anger against you. That's why we're told in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, there is therefore what? Now no condemnation to those in Christ. This Bema seat is not a place for God to condemn you. Oh, yeah, you could say hallelujah to that. Hallelujah. It's great. We're not going to be condemned by Christ. It is a reference, though, to a time of judgment. Now, I did read for you, as we began the message tonight, 2 Corinthians 5.10. Now, I want you to turn there with me to that verse, because I want you to look at it. It should be easy to find. It's the very next book, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. Let's take a look at it together. For we must all, that's every one of us, appear before, you could just say, the Bema seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his or her deeds in the body according to what he or she has done, good or bad. It's important to realize the Bema seat was the elevated judgment or judge's seat that was used at the Olympic Games. Show of hands, how many of you watched the Olympics and seen the judges stand and the athletes standing up there? Okay. Gold, silver, and bronze. The purpose for the Bema seat is not to punish you, but to applaud you for your achievements. That's the whole purpose in mind. The punishment took place at Calvary. The applause should take place at the Bema. When athletes compete in the Olympics, and a person who is sent by his country and set up due to his times to get a first or second, but he goofed off two months before and ended up in sixth place, is that athlete brought before the judges and announced over the intercom, hey, everyone, take a look at this loser from America. Not a word is said. But the athlete himself is brokenhearted because he or she thinks, I could have done better. Any sadness that will be inflicted at the Bama seat, and we'll see that in the film soon, you will inflict upon yourself. Jesus will not put that on you. You say, hey, but I don't like that word that you looked at in verse 10, bad. What about bad? You don't worry so much about bad. It's not the word paleros, which is the word for evil. 
It's the other Greek word you know. Kakas. <laughs> Tell me what Hispanics get from kakas. Let me ask you, is kaka evil? It does stink, and it's good for nothing. OK, good for fertilization. That's one thing. That's about it, though. So when we're using the word bad, we're not talking wicked. We're talking worthless. So when your life is put in the fire, anything that's worthless will be destroyed by the fire and evaporate and go bye-bye. And only that which is of value will last and you'll be honored. You will not be punished for the worthless things you've done. But you will feel sad knowing that that which was worthless could have become worthwhile. Had you just did it with a little bit better attitude. <laughs> That's all it took. That simple? Yes. Didn't Jesus say, a cup of cold water given in my name will not lack a reward? Amen. You stop and give a person a dollar. You smile at a person who's sad. That's going to be part of your glory. Everything you did as a Christian with a great attitude, God's going to reward you for it one day. He won't miss one of those. Isn't that great? Verse 13 of 1 Corinthians chapter 3 as we turn back there. The second part of the verse, the fire itself will test, there it is again, the quality of each person's work. God's concerned about quality. He's not so concerned about what I did. He's asking, why'd you do it? What's your motivation? Now, you and I, we, we can't think of people's motivations. We can't pinpoint them because we can't see their hearts. So therefore, we're always impressed, and we act on the basis of appearance. God's not concerned with appearance. He's concerned with reality. Appearance can be deceiving. It's like the woman who came into church, and she was crying, and the pastor heard that she just lost her husband. And so he walked up. He said, Mary, my condolences. I'm, I'm so sorry to hear of Steve's passing. Oh, well, thank you, Pastor, she said. It's a hard time, isn't it? Yes, she said, it's very hard. Mary, did he have any last requests? She said, yes, Pastor, he did have one. And the pastor asked, what was it? And Mary said, well, he did ask me to please put the gun down. <laughs> We see the weeping widow. God sees the murderous mama. He sees the smoking gun. We look upon the appearance. God sees the reality of why we did what we did. And that's why he told Samuel when he was choosing a king not to go for one of the good-looking boys in Jesse's household. He said, God looks at the anyone heart. He sees the motivation for my life. And that's what he's going to be judging in that day. So that's the surprising revelation. Now to let her be the superb rewards, the superb rewards, verse 14. If any man or woman's work, which he or she has built upon it, remains, in other words, it survives the fire, what happens? You're going to get a reward. If you get through the fire, a reward's coming. Now, we don't know of all the rewards and awards that God's going to give, but we know of five. So I'm encouraging you to shoot for these five. Now, I've stated them before. If you haven't jotted them down, jot them down now, because this is what you're going for, okay? The first reward is the imperishable crown. The imperishable crown. It's found in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. This crown is given to every believer in Christ who has brought the desires of their flesh under control. You come to Christ, you have a problem with lust. So you spend the next 20 to 30 years working on that lust, stepping away from pornography, not looking at women and addressing them with your eyes, you get the crown. 
You come to Christ, you had a problem with a blabbermouth. You spoke about people poorly on a regular basis, and you began by the grace of God to change the mouth, and you started speaking kindly. You're going to get that crown. So I challenge you tonight to look at your personal flaws, which you and I all tend to give into, and ask yourself, have I gotten any better over the course of time? And if you have, you might be open for that reward. Isn't that nice? Yes. It's not having everything together. It's having something together. Isn't that nice? And you will get the imperishable crown. The second crown is called the crown of rejoicing. The crown of rejoicing, 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 to 20. The crown of rejoicing is also known as the soul winner's crown. This is the man or woman or child who loves to share the gospel and loves to lead others to Christ. Do you know that we have a number of people in this church and several in this room tonight who, if they died of a heart attack right now, would be certain to get that crown? They are shooing for it. If you have a passion to tell others about Jesus and a desire to bring them into the kingdom, God said, I have a special crown reserved for you. That's how significant that is in the mind of God. The third, the crown of righteousness. Now, if you miss all the rest of the crowns, please get this one. It's very easy. Paul talked to Timothy about this two weeks before his certain death in the maritime prison. And you'll find it mentioned in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 7. It's a crown that's given to every Christian who looks for and longs for the second coming of Christ. Now, isn't that easy to get? So I decided years ago to start my prayer every single day with the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come. And spend a few moments every morning when I'm on the road saying, Lord, would you come back today? And I'm going to get that crown because he honors those who wait for his return. It's an easy one to get. Next one, not so easy. The fourth crown, the crown of life. The crown of life is James 1.12. Now, I know some saints already tonight who are going to get this. I cannot assure you that I'm going to get this one. This is rewarded to believers who persevere through problems with a pleasant attitude. Yeah. We have a few in our church who've done that. We have four or five ladies who've gone through this time of cancer without a complaint. I'm thinking, I think they're in line for the crown. You say, well, you've gone through four. There's only one more mentioned. I'm really not interested in any of those crowns. Well, you better grab one of them because the last one's for me. And the last one is this. It is the crown of glory and the crown of glory is 1 Peter 5, 4, given to pastors and Paul to elders who faithfully shepherd the flock of God with love, compassion, and care. Because Jesus was the good shepherd, he has a special spot in his heart for all those who shepherd his flock. He's called the chief shepherd. Pastors and elders are the under shepherds and as we shepherd the flock faithfully, not perfectly, we get the crown. Now, that's only a sampling, I believe, of the crowns. But these are the ones we know we could shoot for, for sure. You say, well, what if I get those two or three crowns? I don't know if my head would be big enough to fit all three. What am I going to do with my crowns? Am I going to polish them up? Am I going to put them in a display case? Am I going to brag to others about the crowns? Oh, none of that. Yes, the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 4 that you will present the crowns as you bow at the feet of Jesus and say, for all you've done for me, I want to do this, Jesus, for you. Won't that be a wonderful moment? And that alone is a reason and a motivation for you to want to get as many crowns as you can as a gift of your grace back to him for his grace for you.
So it all sounds good. But it's not all good. Because the fire not only reveals the superb reward, but let her see, it also reveals the sad regret. The sad regret. Verse 15. If any man's work, any woman's work, is burned up, he or she will suffer loss. But he or she will be saved, yet so as through fire. Saved as if through fire? Yeah. Maybe you've heard people say before, oh, no one gets to heaven by the skin of their teeth. Don't you believe it? Some believer is going to get up there with their britches seared with the flames of hell. Woo! And God's going to say, smoking or non-smoking? You know, which one? <laughs> Some people are going to barely make it and have absolutely nothing to show for their life. That's the problem with the death bed conversion. With the thief on the cross who will get the glory but have nothing to give because he lived his whole life for himself. That's why those of you who are younger tonight have more opportunities to live for Christ and to make your life count beginning this evening. And those of us who are at any age still breathing have an opportunity to get to heaven and not have the rumpus room seared, okay? <laughs> And then when you get there, the regrets begin to come. Oh, I wish I wouldn't have engaged in that same stupid sin decade after decade after decade. I wish I would have stopped the horrible things that I uttered from my mouth or I thought in my head about that particular person, that individual in the church that I never really liked. Yes, those regrets will come back to your mind. And so my challenge to you and to me tonight is to start living in such a way that when you see Jesus, you'll have no regrets. You could do it. You could change your life around regardless of how old you may be. You say, but I've made so many mistakes. Well, the manager of an IBM project that lost $10 million before it was scrapped was brought before the CEO. And he came in with his head hanging. And he said, I suppose you want my resignation. And the CEO said, resignation, nothing. We just spent $10 million educating you. <laughs> and that's the way God sees it as well. All the failures, all the mistakes of your life have just been an educational process. And God has invested far more than $10 million into your life. First Peter says he's invested the precious blood of his son, Jesus Christ. And he's purchasing something that's going to last for eternity. So here's the point, and I hope if you miss everything else I've said tonight, don't miss this. God is not giving up on you don't you give up on yourself. Amen. Don't ever give up on yourself. Don't ever quit. Don't ever say, I can't attain to that standard. I can't change the sin. God says, yes, you can. You can alter everything. All you need to do is to turn to me and to say, I'm weak. And he says, I know I'm strong. And I'll give you the strength to overcome any sin, any fault, any failure, I know it could happen because I've personally seen it happen. There's a person that I know who lived many, many, many decades of his life as an alcoholic. In the process, he alienated his bride and angered his adult children. When this man was literally weeks away from certain death, and everyone thought he was going to hell, he woke up. 
and said, I've lost everything. Maybe I ought to get right with God. So he called the pastor. He gave his life to Christ. And he began, began going to AA three to four times a day, every day, for the next 10 to 15 years. He took responsibility for what he had done. He'd asked for forgiveness for his multiple failures. He regained the love of his bride. He earned the respect of his adult children. And today, he's a much admired man in the church that he attends and serves. And when he breathes his last breath, he will do so with no regret. Let's bow our heads together. Would you like to redeem your regrets tonight? Right there where you're seated. Tell God, by your grace, I will turn my life around starting tonight. I will take whatever steps are necessary to right yesterday's wrongs. Because I want to be rewarded at your judgment seat. Take a moment in the silence and tell him that right now. You know, it's highly possible that you're present here tonight and you can't recall a time when you asked Christ to lay the support for your personal life. You don't ever remember asking him to forgive your sin, to accept you as a son or daughter. And tonight you've decided that's going to change for time and eternity. This is the evening in which I will release my life to the God of love. If that's where your heart's at tonight, then I want to personally pray for you. But I need to have an indication that that's where you're located at. So what I'd like you to do is to take your right hand and raise it good and high. When I see that uplifted hand, you're saying to me and to God, tonight is the night I'm giving my life to Christ for the very first time. Is that your desire? Then while no one's looking around except for me, raise your hand good and high. God bless you, brother. Thank you. Father, this has been a soul-searching time for each one of us this evening. And yet, I hope it's been an encouraging time as well. Your love for us is magnanimous. And we're going to see that after we feed our faces to come back and see a film that's going to portray the wonder of what it's like to stand before you. Thank you for all these faithful people who took time out of a Sunday afternoon to come to hear your word. They're already building into eternity with gold, silver, and precious stones. My prayer is that you would give your richest blessings upon their lives. Thank you for meeting us here tonight. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.